Good evening. There is no completion, of course, but for certain reasons we can say we are complete, so we can start. Uh, in the name of the Whitehead Research Project, I wanted to welcome you very warmly to this third international conference of the Whitehead Research Project, this time on Judy Butler and Alfred North Whitehead as catalysts of contemporary thought. And uh, especially thanks to Professor Butler for being here and also a warm welcome to our audience and especially, of course, to our participants. This conference was made possible uh, with the help of two institutions, the Claremont Credit University and its schools of religion and especially arts of humanities, and the School of Theology, the Claremont School of Theology, uh, who houses since the 1970s the Center for Process Studies, which was kind of the basis for the Whitehead Research Project to emerge. And I want to especially thank the, the graduate students who work with WRP and have greatly helped to make this, with their energy and time, to make this event possible and make it a event. WRP was founded under the premise that the effort to study Whitehead must remain current in research, connective in the scope, and contemporary in its effort to engage with philosophies and their impact on our world today. One of the most violent philosophies today, post-structuralism, was a natural contender of all three. And the first conference of WRP centered on connections with other current philosophies of the event, Deleuze's and Badius. And Jeffrey Bell and Catherine Keller have been present at this conference. I can also inform you that the book created from this conference is near completion and will be published soon next year under the title Event and Decision, Ontology and Politics in Badiou, Deleuze, and Whitehead. Ever since interesting interferences between Derrida and Whitehead were diagnosed several years ago, it was at this point not inconceivable that a common engagement in the deconstruction of logocentrism will eventually lead to an engagement with its phallogocentric modes and not so unexpectedly the work of Judith Butler. Common interest in a philosophy of the body, of a critique of substantialism and essentialism, as well as the reception of Whitehead in feminist thought since at least the 70s of the last century, might have contributed to the fact that as Catherine Keller and I convened a session on Whitehead and post-structuralism uh, at the sixth International Whitehead Conference in Salzburg in Austria, 2006. All papers were either on Deleuze or on Butler. Krista Hughes was there, where's Krista? Here, Krista Hughes was there. Sigrid Dürer was there, good boss thought here. Michael Halewood was there, Michael sits here. And uh, Christa, Christina Hutchins was there, sitting here. Also, Christina Hutchins uh, greatly shaping this project's content and in a Whiteheadian terms, so to say, luring Professor Butler here. <laughs> when Fortem Press, uh, the publisher of some of the recent uh, works of Judy Butler, showed interest in my proposal to a book that would, maintain, would entertain all three philosophers, another project was born based on the Salzburg Conference and greatly expanded so as to accommodate uh, expected and unexpected uh, connotations and connections between the three philosophies. Its final product can be, so to say, presented today even as an announcement that very soon this book will be out in print. Secrets of Becoming. <laughs> Secrets of Becoming, Negotiating Whitehead, Deleuze, and Butler. Uh, it was edited by Andrea Stevenson and me. And we had also contributors of this book present here, uh, mentioned Catherine, Jeffrey, Michael, Andrea, and Ellen von Weick. Ellen is where? Uh, you didn't make it down. Good. Finally, to round up our participants, Ellen Armar, with her expertise, has been publishing in this area for years. And a student panel tomorrow, 
uh, will feature another anomaly, uh, anomaly, uh, anomaly in our philosophical landscape. Students of both Butler and Whitehead, who in their own way might take these initiatives into a next generation. A word to the theme of the conference. Becomings, misplacements, departures. A complicated name, somehow. Had to think twice about it, anyway. It reflects elements present in both philosophers. Their understanding of this transient world in its structural commitments, their development of distinct theories of becoming, of syntactical violence, and of the creative opportunities of limitations. How, we can ask, can we give an account of our concerted becomings in a complex world of structural violence? What powers of destruction are enacted by misplacing concrete becoming through essentializing reductionist and power stabilizing abstractions? <coughs> How might process or processive theories and performative practices enable modes of departure from fixed and controllable identities, categories, and ideals? And thinking of uncontrollable identities, at this point, I want to extend my uh, uh, appreciation for Sigurdur, who had to suffer a misspelling of her name. We couldn't translate the Icelandish D, which looks like an O with an X on it. <laughs> so in the first, the first translation, we couldn't even decide on it. It became a D and O in your first name. In your second name, it became just an O without a D. <laughs> so it should be a D kind of spoken as a D. So we tried to uh, kind of, it, there's a hist so to say, it's history. It's still present physically in some of the material you have. That these questions imply wide consequences for the pressing issues of contemporary of the of our contemporary world, ecologically, mm -hmm. ethically, politically, philosophically, aesthetically, and regarding the habits of humanity in an ever-changing and power-riddled world, might become even more evident when we remind ourselves that the reign of phallocentrism is far from over. Consider these two current facts. First, while the hate crimes in general have diminished in the US in 2008, the most significant crescendo appeared with the ones related to sexual orientation. It spiked 4% alone in LA County in which we are. Second, as a direct outcome of American politics, namely the emergency plan for AIDS relief, the promotion of homophobia in Africa has received such aid money helping in the legal suppression of homosexuality. Uganda's campaign against homosexuality has, in recent weeks, led to a legislation that actual or even just perceived homosexuality, which is already illegal under Ugandan law, in case of repetition would imply death penalty. The population is encouraged to alarm the authorities if they suspect that their neighbors or colleagues are not heterosexual. This may leave us with an even more urgent sensitivity towards Butler's critical theorizing of the genesis of gender, sex, and sexuality, bodily subjectivity, subversive speech acts, the inauguration of queer theory, the unending becoming of social relations, and the critique of the violence of contemporary political regimes uh, as they foreclose human freedoms. And it might leave us with a greater sensitivity for, new for a new reading of Whitehead as precisely and paradoxically in the line of ancestry of these deconstructive, anti-foundationalist, power-critical, feminist, and ecological political discourses. Whitehead's vision of a multiverse of ultimately uncontrollable becoming, of the compulsory corporality and sociality of all existence, and of the creative resources of activity might make him a true resource in the apureus of contemporary thought for an ethical, political, and eco ecological activation in our riddled world. Mm -hmm. And in this sense, I hope this conference will inspire us. So welcome again. And now we have a welcome from the two deans of the two schools of uh, CGU, Fairmont Graduate University, before we really begin. So it's a 
almost beginning. So uh, I think Thank you, Roland. I promise to be really brief. Um, um, uh, I, it's my duty as Dean of Arts and Humanities um, to say just a word about the um, Bradshaw Fund, which is uh, contributing a bit of uh, uh, support for this conference. Um, it was established in memory of Thornton F. Bradshaw, former chairman of the Board of Fellows of Claremont Graduate University and Center. Um, the Bradshaw name is attached to this program because, quote, it represents his ideals, humanities, and the arts as part of a public person. The program was initially launched in June of 1990 by an initial grant of $200,000 from the General Electric Foundation. I did want to say that. And now um, um, I, I uh, want to say thank you uh, so much to um, Roland Faber and to uh, Daniel Pettis in particular and to others who work to make this terrific event happen. And I want to say welcome to distinct, our distinguished uh, guests. I'm just, just to make this a little different from the other welcomes, I thought I would just name the places um, or the institutions. Uh, Vanderbilt, Seattle, Southeastern Louisiana University, Pacific School of Religion, Drew University, and from overseas, Iceland, uh, the University of Essex, uh, and the University of Technology uh, in, in Sydney. Uh, and of course, special welcome and thanks to keynote speaker Judith Butler, who has already given generously of her time and spirit holding a seminar on her work in this, in this uh, auditorium earlier this afternoon for students in arts and humanities, religion, and um, school of theology. Um, I saw with horror that I'm on the program and a wrap-up session on in Saturday, so I'm not going to try to say anything now substantial about the, uh, about the conference or about any ideas I might have. I have to save every tiny scrap of thought I might come up with, except <laughs> I'm, I'm making a promise. I'm going to try to say something about these fascinating images. As, as, um, as Roland was speaking, I couldn't help just staring at them, and I want to do something about philosophers oh, and suitcases. Um, uh, and unattended baggage, which uh, you, know, you never know. I, I, so I'll, I'll, tr I'll try to think of something. In, a, in any case, uh, welcome. And, uh, and now, Anselm Min, Dean of Religion. Well, good evening. Uh, I've been wondering on my way why any conference deserves a welcome from two deans. <laughs> <laughs> but joking aside, on behalf of the School of Religion, I would really like to welcome all of you, uh, Professor Judith Butler, all the uh, speakers, and all the participants. And I'm very gratified to see a large turnout like this given the time of the day and given the time of the school year. Uh, I really appreciate your attendance. Whitehead once said that uh, things do not remain the same after the shock of a great philosopher. There's something I love to quote even in my classes. It seems to me that the shock will be even greater and even more predictable when two great minds interact, as we are going to see in this conference between Professor Judith Butler and the representatives of the Whiteadian tradition. <clears throat> I have read the two papers that will be presented this evening, and if there is any indication, I'm sure that we are in for a great feast for the mind. Maybe I shouldn't have said mind, that sounds so dualistic, so I would say for the embodied mind. Yeah. I'm really looking forward to an exciting celebration of new ideas and new thoughts and new insights that will stretch our Im conceptual imagination to the limit, deconstructing, destabilizing, contaminating, and always complicating and problematizing our concepts, which seem to be almost always irretrievably addicted to reification and essentialization. I would like to congratulate uh, my colleague and friend, Roland Faber, for organizing this exciting conference with such a distinguished panel. It is also my great honor and pleasure uh, to introduce the two distinguished speakers who will present the first double lecture. <clears throat> 
and I've been noticing Roland's penchant for double lectures, you know. Uh, <laughs> uh, the two lectures are responses to a theme Professor Butler has been exploring, especially in her recent works, the theme of the vulnerability of embodied existence and the constitutive sociality it implies. The first speaker will be engaging it from the Whiteheadian perspective, pushing it further in terms of cosmic sociality. The second speaker will do the same by intensifying it further in a Levinasian direction. I can assure you that we are in for a real intellectual treat. The first speaker, Catherine Keller, who will be speaking on undoing and unknowing, the widening relations of Butler and Whitehead. She has been on the faculty of the Theological School of Drew University uh, and is graduate division of religion for the last uh, two decades and uh, longer. Uh, in her teaching, lecturing, and writing in a multiplicity of different settings, she has been seeking in her own expression to midwife a theology of becoming. As director of the annual Drew Transdisciplinary Theological Colloquium since inception, inception in uh, 2000, she has been working with colleagues and students to foster a hospitable local setting for planetary conversations. Her books include On the Mystery, Discerning Divinity in Process, God and Power, Counterapocalyptic Journeys, and the phase of the deep, a theology of becoming. I have a special reason to welcome uh, Professor Catherine Keller. She is one of the most outstanding graduates of the School of Religion. When the school was still a department of religion, she was here working with Professor John Cobb. And I'm so happy and delighted to have back I know she has been back on this campus many times over, but it's always nice to have you back anytime. So uh, without further ado, let me just uh, introduce Professor uh, Catherine Keller. Okay. Thank you, deans and, and Roland and all of you. Um, it, it is eerily like coming home. I had opened my pre-distributed paper with the poem of a medieval mystic on the subject of a gruesome wit, gruelic wit in the old Dutch, an unbearable but irresistible wit of the subject herself. It undoes her, Hadevich says. Yes, 800 years, BJB, before Judith Butler. <laughs> <laughs> the poem reads in part, in the infinite, I reach for the uncreated. I have touched it. It undoes me. The Flemish is undone. Wider than wide. Everything else is too narrow. You know this well, you who are also there. This old begin lets me first of all congratulate Roland Faber on widening the mission of process thought into the Whitehead Research Project. Of course, what made the Center for Process Studies magnetic for so many of us already decades before Roland's advent was its transdisciplinary resistance to the narrowness of Western thought in its theological as well as secularist orthodoxies. John Cobb, who coined the term postmodern in the 60s, was already reaching for the uncreated. So was his student Marjorie Suhaki, the teacher of so many of you here tonight. Wider than wide. Process theology has opened unprecedented passages, at once theoretical and prophetic, into cosmological, ecological, economic, political, feminist, and interreligious urgencies. You know this well, you who have been also there. But such wit was falling out of fashion by the 80s, and process thought, with its ontological, not to mention theological encumbrances might have succumbed to terminal deconstruction. But instead, a more productive undoing has prevailed, drawing a number of us into engagement with varieties of post-structuralism. Faber's leadership in this operatic passage is manifest in this philosophical series, 
and there is no greater tribute to its success than the presence here in its third year of Judith Butler, that we may read her to her face and not just behind her back <laughs> is a rare privilege. And those of us who attended the AAR in Montreal a month ago may have noticed how often now she's being spoken of in the disciplines of religion and theology. Yet many post-structuralists do far more with theology than she does. And as to the present conversation, other continentally rooted thinkers, such as Deleuze, Stengers, Haraway, and Latour, draw on Whitehead explicitly, which, unless I missed it, she has not until very recently. Yet there is in the voice of her thinking something a number of us apparently need for our varied spectrum of projects, whether in process philosophy or in theology, in feminist or queer or political theology, with or without Whiteheadian contamination. We'll all be naming it for ourselves as the conference unfolds. As for me, there is much that I have appreciated in Butler's thinking in its game-changing late 20th century works. But there is something happening in the 21st century, Butler, that I actually can't do my own work without. It's a little bit odd. I need her thinking for something that I'm calling an apophatic relationalism. Our relations bring us to the edge of language and over that edge, the unknown tosses us back into those relations, abysmally widened. That unknowing has behind it the deepest reaches of theology in its negative or apophatic, apophatic means unsaying, uh, gestures. Perhaps I find her thought theologically helpful precisely because her books remain minimally, minimally worried about theological language and its postmodern, post-God, or post-death of God quandaries. Theology has been coming undone for an awfully long time. And if it isn't, we theologians are missing something. <laughs> <laughs> but I don't seek her help to do or to undo God, but rather to account for certain doings and undoings of ourselves because she gets the relation between our constituent relationality and our unknowingness. There isn't any other philosopher I've found who so directly theorizes the link between the social ontology of the self and our inextricable unknowing. She writes, for instance, in Precarious Life, for if I am confounded by you, then you are already of me and I am nowhere without you. I cannot muster the we except by finding the way in which I am tied to you, by trying to translate, but finding that my own language must break up and yield. It's apophasis, language breaking up. If I am to know you, you are what I gain through this disorientation and loss. This is how the human comes into being again and again as that which we have yet to know. It is where, for Butler, the undoing knowingly becomes unknowing. When Butler catches the wider connectivity as it escapes the net of language, its excess registers, first of all, as a self-opacity, an ignorance about oneself. Moments of unknowingness about oneself, she writes, tend to emerge in the context of relations to others, suggesting that these relations call upon primary forms of relationality that are not always available to explicit and reflective thematization. Her long-term work with Foucault and with psychoanalysis, joined in their disjunction in the psychic life of power, moves her into this third millennium lucidity as to our opacity. But the opacity, like the unknown and infinite in Whitehead, appears not as a mere blackout of knowledge, but as a destabilizing recognition of interdependence, not altogether unlike quantum entanglement. That interdependence has taken on an ontological, indeed in a carefully qualified sense, a universal scope. 
If my fate, she writes, is not originally or finally separable from yours, then the we, traversed by a relationality that we cannot easily argue against, uh, then the we is traversed by a relationality that we cannot easily argue against without, she says, denying something fundamental about the social conditions of our very formation. For Butler, vulnerability and mourning, politically widened, offer the key to the self she has been willing now to ontologize. With Whitehead, it is desire, or the lure to greater complexity, cosmologically widened, that keys in the unknowable reach of relations. Yet Butler's grief work is inflected by desire, and Whitehead's turn from math to cosmology is partly inspired by mourning, death of his son. I stress in my paper the common thread of their critique of the substantial subject with its essential identity of sex, gender, character, tradition, but also the intriguingly parallel direction of their constructive alternatives to substance metaphysics. Christina Hutchins, the pioneer of the Butler-Whitehead contrast, demonstrated how both replace enduring self-identity with repetition. The necessary inescapable repetition of becoming, she writes, for both Whitehead and Butler carries in itself hope of and for the future because repetition is the way in which novelty, Whitehead, or subversive resignification, Butler, can enter the ongoing processes of discourse in the world. Uh, this repetition has the character of performativity or event. Unlike the tedium of sameness, the iterativity makes possible life, parity, difference. Indeed, for Whitehead, the universe is made not of building blocks of matter, but of rhythms of relation, rhythms of iterative relation. One might say for him as well that the repetitions carry the work of mourning and incorporation. For what he calls perpetual perishing characterize, pro characterizes process. Each event of becoming, human or otherwise, emerges from its incorporations or prehensions of its antecedent world. Speaking of rhythms of relation, you know, by a nice coincidence, or what we theologians call uh, providence, um, I was sent only a couple days ago a manuscript by Clayton Crockett in which he was discussing Butler's reading of Benjamin's theological-political fragment. She quotes him as saying that the rhythm of this eternally transient worldly existence, transient in its totality, in its spatial but also its temporal totality, the rhythm of messianic nature is happiness. She's reflecting on how the messianic thwarts the teleological unfolding of time by restoring life to its transient rhythm. Such a non-telic messianicity would, of course, be the only sort of eschatology one can craft from the Whiteheadian sense of process, wouldn't it be, where purposefulness is in the moment, in the moment of becoming. But the moment is a spatio-temporal microcosm of the world. Now, even more providentially, or perhaps Kabbalistically, Crockett was using this Butlerian rhythm to elaborate on Caputo's reading of The Face of the Deep, where I happen to draw out the Deleuzean Whiteheadian chaosmos of rhythmic polyphony as a cipher for the lost chaos of Genesis and an alternative to the coercive force of omnipotence. The repetition in Whitehead is the prehension of the past in the present, bouncing toward the iteration of the present in its own future. There, the messianic, or for Whitehead, the lure, would come into play. It lacks the power of a traditional creator, the mythic violence with which to control the outcome. The event will instead, in each instance, be determined by the indeterminate interactions of creatures. I hope that my essay showed the way that in both Butler and Whitehead, repetition folds into relationality, which unfolds its ethical enigmas 
and which cloud into unknowing. But Butler brings forth much better than Whitehead the relevance of the unknowing to the ethical. It may be that what is right and what is good, she says, consist in staying open to the tensions that beset the most fundamental categories we require to know unknowingness at the core of what we know and what we need and to recognize the signs of life and its prospects. One finds this apophatic moment in ethics hinted at in key moments of feminist theology, as for instance, when Ivona Guevara links the acute poverty of her urban favela in Recife with the desecration of the non-human planet. She writes of the dimension of a not knowing as a fundamental dimension of our being. That, she says, makes us more humble and at the same time more combative that lets us, she writes, gain respect for differences and the possibility of building an interdependent society. Gabara is not a process theologian, uh, but almost. In her eco-feminist critique of her own Catholic liberation theological lineage, she claims affinity with panentheism and the metaphor of the world as God's body she got from McFaig, whom we all know got it from Charles Hartshorn. That older dissident Catholic, Hadevich, had called the width of her feeling for all the inhabitants of the earth, even of hell, love, but a love horribly wide, gruelig wit. Butler has taken on that painful width in the circulation of her thought through sex and gender, through the war in Iraq, Muslim immigrants in Europe, Palestinians in Israel. So when I raise in my question, the, in my paper, the question of eco-social justice with its appeal to the cosmological width of our interdependencies, it isn't actually that I think she should shift gear. One doesn't need her to do anything more or other than what she's already doing. The question is whether her recognition of the signs of life and its prospects might not on principle extend to the non-human universe. That is whether others, such as some of us working in the discursive tension of this very conference, might not tease out the cosmological width of the relations that form us beyond and before our knowing. Hence I suggest going easy on the rhetoric of denaturalization unless we first make clear that the counterfeit naturalizations by which a culture reproduces itself can and must be read obversely as violations of so-called nature. Nature is no more a cultural construction than culture is a natural construction. What more than the climate crisis exposes the truth of the following proposition, another quotable Butlerianism, that our life is always coming from a source that is elsewhere and directed toward something that is beyond me, constituted in a sociality I do not fully author. Relationality, we might say, goes all the way down. It does not stop at some point where then inert matter takes over. So Whiteheadians have long been writing the body differently. The human body, he says Whitehead in Mode's Thought, is that region of the world which is the primary field of human expression. Whitehead has modeled a universe in which sociality infinitely precedes and exceeds the human. It hosts an eco-social thinking resistant to scientific reductionism, but welcoming of new twists in science. New twists very recently, such as when the physicist Lee Smolin says the universe is not made of things, but of relations. The Belgian philosopher of science, Isabel Stengers, one of the small troop of Euro Whiteheadians, coined the term cosmopolitique, names the series of her books. It tugs ethics into dialogue with the natural sciences in order to democratize them and to ecologize democracy. The corporate cosmopolitanism currently in charge of the planet 
is producing a global culture of polis denuded of cosmos and therefore dead to the indeterminate emergent complexity of our planetary creatureless, creatureliness. Mm -hmm. Now I might want to say something like the performative theory of action has to be resituated in a relational understanding of living organisms, human and non-human, to understand both what sustains life and what imperils it. Oh, I might want to say that, but I don't have to. I just read this on the plane. It's in Butler's talk for tomorrow. <laughs> so she's already there. Such cosmopolitical performances, I can just say in, conclu in concluding, having taken the wind out of the sails of any critique I might have offered, necessarily involves us in complications beyond our ken. Hence, I resort these days to a 15th century complicatio, where the multiplicity of relations are folded together in the docta ignorantia, the knowing ignorance. Yet, as Nicholas of Cusa knew, apophatically, the creation is itself unfinished, infini, boundless, uncentered. At every unfurling edge, we reach. Too much to do, too much to undo. But there is no theological escape from the gruesome width. To mind now also the animal, vegetable, and mineral constituents of our very selves is to open our knowing into the virtual infinity of our unknown relations. In that stretch, our anthropocentrism comes undone. But our humanity may newly arise wider than wide. Thanks. The, the subject of the next uh, paper is Picoming Terry Scheibel, and the, the presenter is uh, Professor Ellen Armour, uh, who is the successor to Sally McFaig at Vanderbilt University uh, in the E. Rose and Leona B. Carpenter Chair in Feminist Theology and as Director of the Carpenter Program in Religion, Gender, and Sexuality. Her research interests are in feminist theology, theories of sexuality, race, gender, disability, and embodiment, and contemporary continental philosophy. And her current project is Science and Wonders, the Theology After Modernity. I'm extremely curious about what those signs and wonders <laughs> will be. You know. uh, it gives me a great pleasure, especially to note that uh, she and I share one thing in common. We have the common doctoral father at Vanderbilt University, Peter Hudson. So please welcome uh, <laughs> Professor Ellen Armour. <laughs> Well, thanks to Anselm for that kind introduction, to Roland for um, organizing this fabulous conference along with your co-organizers and helpers, um, to Judith for being here, um, to all of you also for taking the time to uh, entertain conjunctions between Whitehead and Judith Butler, and to my fellow respondents and paper givers. I hope that was a kind of cheery introduction because we're about to get really gloomy, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, the notion of becoming initially seems to open onto a, a utopian horizon. It invites us to imagine a future wherein we escape the limits of current regimes and come to embody new forms and ways of being. But I want to call our attention to a more ambivalent instance of becoming, one that is available to us here and now, though I doubt any of us would willingly embrace it. I speak of the case of Teresa, commonly known as Terry Shivo, a severely disabled young white married woman who in 2005 became a cause celebre for the pro-life religious right. I find Judith Butler's work helpful in coming to terms with many of the issues Ms. Shivo case, Ms. Shivo's case raises. And Anselm, to answer your question, this is one of the signs and wonders. <laughs> um, at the same time, I think the case pushes Butler's work in what I hope are productive ways. Already in my one-sentence description of Ms. Shivo, 
several vectors of identity and the regimes that produce and sustain them. Many of them subjected to analysis by Butler have announced their claim. It is certainly the case that these vectors of identity and the systems through which they co-articulate always play out upon embodied subjects. But Ms. Schiavo's state of embodiment is of particular salience here. It's that specific convergence of gender, race, sexuality, kinship, religion, politics, and the law in and on a person so seriously disabled that calls for deeper analysis. So becoming Terry Schiavo, part one. I start with an epigraph from Representative Barney Frank, Democrat of Massachusetts. Perhaps you'll recognize it when you hear it. Quote, we're not doctors, we just play them on C-SPAN. It was in response to Bill Frist diagnosing Terry Schiavo. Perhaps you remember that scene. In 1990, Teresa Schiavo was left in a persistent vegetative state, that's the technical term, when her brain was deprived of oxygen for several minutes due to a heart attack brought on by potassium shortage, itself probably caused by undiagnosed bulimia. The persistent vegetative state in which some 10 to 15,000 people in the United States are currently living by one estimate is more accurately described as the state of being awake but not aware. The brain stem, which houses the more primitive mental functions, the sleep-wake cycle, for example, still works, but the part of the brain that houses what we call consciousness does not. The person in such a state reacts to noises, opens her eyes, appears to look around, makes sounds herself, but exhibits no consistency in responding to particular stimuli. Ms. Schiavo's brain injury had deprived her of the ability to swallow without aspirating. Effective swallowing requires consciousness. Thus, her life was sustained by a feeding tube. Ms. Schiavo became a national celebrity some 12 years after becoming the center of a long legal battle that pitted her husband, who with other witnesses wanted the feeding tube removed, arguing that she would not want to be kept alive in this condition, against her family of origin, who maintained that her current state, or future, if rehab were provided her, justified keeping the feeding tube in place. Press coverage focused on the drama staged by pro-life religious activists and their mostly Republican political allies in both the state government of Florida and our nation's capital. Now, Ms. Schiavo's case also caught the attention of disability rights activists, though they got very little mainstream press during the weeks that the story dominated the news. I'll have more to say about that shortly. That the pro-life movement took up Ms. Schiavo's cause is hardly incidental to the vectors of identity I've named above, or so I would argue. On the one hand, her status as white, married, and therefore presumptively heterosexual woman grants her social recognition and a certain value within our racialized heteronormative system. But that status and value comes at a certain price. We know from Lacanian inflected psychoanalysis, an important strand of Butler's work, that the place to which one exceeds as straight white woman in a phallogocentric system is that of object of desire and of speech rather than subject. In a sense, then, her disability traded on the conditions of subjection already realized in her sex, gendered, and marital status. Ms. Schiavo's inability to speak for herself, an ability already attenuated prior to her injury by virtue of her subject position, hollows out space into which others come to stand as her proxies. These include a long list of people, her husband and friends, her parents, her guardians ad litem, the pro-life activist, and even Senator Bill Frist. Had we time, each of these occupants would be interesting to analyze. Being spoken for, particularly by those who speak in the name of the paternal law, father, husband, priest, and senator, comes with the territory of white womanhood constituted as it is, as passive, pure, and domesticated. But Ms. Schiavo's condition also created a crisis within the heteronormative kinship system in which she had come to be. In the first years after Ms. Schiavo's heart attack, her parents and husband had cooperated in her care, but now they were locked in a legal battle over their daughter and wife. The political drama that unfolded around Ms. Schiavo painted the breach as irrevocable, and probably rightly so. But it's important to pause for a moment to acknowledge this as loss and crisis. Affective and familial ties were stretched to the breaking point in the name of taking responsibility. Moreover, our heteronormative kinship system, and thus its crisis, is not only affective and familial, it is also rhetorical, epistemological, political, legal, and juridical, and thus social. 
The transfer of daughter from father to husband had been legally performed years before, yet the parents were now challenging that transfer. At one point, they petitioned the court on Ms. Schiavo's behalf to divorce Mr. Schiavo. Who has the right to speak for Ms. Schiavo, to speak on her behalf? Who can claim to know, really know, what she would have wanted? And note the absence of much concern about what she might want now or whether she wants. Would it be her husband, her father, her mother, their priest? To whom does Ms. Schiavo belong in the end, if no longer to herself? What right do any of us have to stand in such a place, to pronounce, to announce, to diagnose, to decide, to legislate her fate? I found myself, at least, longing for just one of those would-be Solomons to step back and admit, we are not Ms. Schiavo, we are all just playing her on C-SPAN. <laughs> Okay, Becoming Terry Schiavo, Part 2, Subjectivity and Vulnerability. That Ms. Schiavo survived her heart attack at all is a result of the considerable advances in modern medicine in recent decades. To a degree unprecedented in human history, we human beings hold the power of life and death in our hands. But we cannot predict in advance what form a life saved, which is, of course, a death postponed, may take. Medical technologies have created and sustained forms of human life that were not viable before. We cannot wish these technologies away and probably wouldn't want to. But outcomes like Terry Schiavo's catch us up short. How able are we to live with and into these new forms of human life? In Psychic Life of Power and Precarious Life, Butler explores certain vulnerabilities that unmake subjects and the social context in which they come to be. I should say unmake and make subjects. In Psychic Life of Power, Butler focuses on the conditions that give rise to subjectivity, a term she reserves there for the linguistic and socially constituted position that says I. Subjectivity in this sense is not a substantive essence, but an ongoing process of becoming. Its roots lie in the need for social recognition, a primal vulnerability visibly and audibly present in infancy that remains with us throughout life. That vulnerability compels us or propels us to respond to those interpolations that call us into being as gendered, raced, sexed, individuated, etc. Thus, we become subjects in giving ourselves over to subjection, in submitting ourselves to those people and regimes that promise us social recognition and thus viability. This need is so strong that we will even subject ourselves to individuals or regimes that neglect or actively harm us, for any social recognition is better than none at all. It is precisely in and through the structural vulnerability that we are empowered. Power, understood in Foucault's sense as a diffuse network of relations, takes us in and we take it on up. Not only juridical power, the terminal form power takes, as Foucault puts it, but more importantly, the subtle normalizing form of power that runs through the regimes of sex, gender, race, kinship, etc., that grant us social identities and, st and status. Normalizing power is able to work on and through us by exploiting this primal vulnerability. Our agency, through which we conform or resist, repeat faithfully or not, or repudiate, resides in this nexus of self-submission and self-making. We are this interplay of our sedimented history, some of which we can know or with help recall, much of which remains necessarily invisible and inaccessible to us, a mix of that and novel becoming. Each layer calls upon and covers over, for the moment, this constitutive vulnerability. Each recitation of becoming exposes again this vulnerability and provides the opportunity for doing otherwise, for to recite is not necessarily to repeat. Becoming a subject is, Butler tells us, quote, no simple or continuous affair, but an uneasy practice of repetition and its risks, compelled yet incomplete, wavering on the horizon of social being, unquote. Our status as subjects, then, is never fully achieved and never fully secured. If psychic life of power focuses on the becoming of subjectivity, precarious life turns our attention to its undoing. The essays contained therein take their mark from the events of September 11, 2001 and the U.S. response. The violence of the terrorist attacks of that day has been met with more violence inflicted not only on the enemy in Afghanistan and later in Iraq and elsewhere outside the U.S., but its suspected allies in the homeland, including those who dissent from U.S. policy, a different form of violence, but a kind of violence nonetheless. In Violence Morning in Politics, Butler reads this response as a kind of displaced mourning, 
She urges us to find some other way of coping with the losses incurred that day, a way that can mobilize a different kind of politics and ethics other than revenge and thus seemingly endless war, one that refuses to curtail rights and liberties, that affirms rather than rejects global affiliation and interdependence, that makes space to mourn not only our dead, but those killed in our name. The events of 9-11 exploited, exploited and exposed the same primal vulnerability that psychic life of power located at the center of subjectivity, Butler argues. Examining that center and its effects from this site of its exploitation brings to light some additional insights. As center, vulnerability renders subjects eccentric and ecstatic. That is, no I is truly the center of its own being. It is hollowed out at its core by vulnerability. Moreover, each I stands outside itself insofar as this vulnerability impels us toward others as sites and sources of recognition. Each I then is in part a we insofar as it is comprised of attachments to those who enable us to say I. Parents and other family members, yes, but also teachers, friends, neighbors, lovers, etc. And this network extends to the anonymous they of our social world, a global they. We are individually and collectively made and unmade by one another on scales large and small. We experience this unmaking on an individual scale when we grieve the loss of a loved one, but this loss echoes the undoing that desire launches in the first place. The attacks on 9-11, Butler suggests, undid us, some more than others, on a social scale. They traded on our attachments at a number of levels and brought home to us the extent of our dependence on far-flung others for our very being. These insights into subjectivity and its limits were born in contexts very different from Terry Schiavo's situation. Psychic Life of Power offers an account of a kind of becoming to which Ms. Schiavo lost access, thanks to her heart attack, long before she became a public figure. And Precarious Life was provoked not by private family tragedy and conflict rendered public political theater, but by what followed in the wake of a frontal assault on the U.S. body politic. Yet I think both provide insights that we can mine as we attempt to come to terms with becoming Terry Schiavo. At the same time, Ms. Schiavo's situation pushes and extends Butler's insights in certain ways. A central question motivating Butler's work on social and subjective vulnerability in these texts and elsewhere is this, whose lives are livable, whose deaths are grievable? It's precisely that issue that mobilized the disability activists I mentioned briefly earlier. Some resisted any alliance of Ms. Schiavo's case with their cause because of the severity of her mental condition. Others saw in her situation the issue at the heart of their cause. Ms. Schiavo's life had been deemed unlivable. If that judgment held, it would mean, or it result, result in denying her access to what her life required for its sustenance. These activists knew quite well that for most people, the specter of a severe disability, quadriplegia, paraplegia, severe brain injury, et cetera, seems a fate worse than death. Indeed, many of the activists had probably expressed some of that sentiment themselves before and in many cases after, in the aftermath, at least the immediate aftermath of their own disablement. But many of them now found themselves in quite a different place. Their primary obstacle wasn't their condition as much as it was society's failure to accommodate it. Disability theorist Rosemary, Rosemary Garland Thompson argues that both the disabled body subject, the crip in disability rights lingo, and the normate, that's her term, are socially constituted subject positions produced in relationship to each other. This asymmetrical binary posits the crip as a vividly embodied stigmatized other whose social role is to symbolically free the privileged idealized figure of the American self from the vagaries and vulnerabilities of embodiment. Symbolically is the crucial term here, for as disability studies scholars frequently note, being able-bodied and or of relatively sound mind is a temporary state for all of us. Those of us who are not disabled by trauma or disease before we reach our so-called golden years will certainly be then. Facing up to the realities of these forms of becoming require, I think, a different approach to quote the vagaries and vulnerabilities of embodiment than the crip normate binary allows. And it's here that I find Butler's work especially helpful. Her emphasis on subjectivity as acquisition, and a tenuous one at that, articulates both subjectivity's emergences and its disintegrations. 
Moreover, reserving the term subjectivity for a linguistic and social position, leaving terms like perhaps individual and person as placeholders for the human being considered under other rubrics, simultaneously calls attention to our cultural bias toward linguisticality as the mark of humanization and provides leverage against that bias. For more primordial than linguisticality is a vulnerability at once social and physical that constitutes all of us from birth to death no matter what our state of ability or disability. Ms. Shiva was as primordially vulnerable, socially and physically, on her wedding day as on the day they pulled her feeding tube. Where the prospect of becoming Terry Shivo pushes Butler is, I think, toward a deeper realization of the ways bodies matter, of the way we are all grounded and ungrounded by the materiality of the body. Butler speaks frequently, especially in precarious lives, about the body's vulnerability to attacks from the outside. But Ms. Shivo's case calls attention to the body's vulnerability from the inside. And that vulnerability runs right through subjectivity, even as, or perhaps especially as, linguistic and social position, insofar as linguisticality presupposes the materiality of the brain. Now, I am not here plopping the body down in our midst as, after all, an unsurpassable lumpen thing that will, no matter what, have the last word. Thinking bodily vulnerability from the inside out rather than the outside in may push Butler's analysis, but not in ways that are antithetical to it. Her work keeps together in ways few others do, the social and the personal, the material and the cultural, reminding us that all of it together constitutes a network of contingencies, doings and undoings, makings and unmakings. Internal bodily vulnerability is part and parcel of this larger network of contingency and of the specific features, systemic and otherwise, that constitute the forms it takes in our time and place. And here I want to add my voice to others, including Butler's, that you'll hear over the next few days that call for a new ontology of life. Butler helps us see that internal vulnerability, too, is as much social as, and, as physical all the way down. Let me retrace the steps involved in becoming Terry Schiavo now from the inside out. The physical breakdown caused by her heart attack certainly traded on the physical vulnerability that comes with embodiment. It also inaugurated a violent and permanent return to that pre-linguistic state of primordial vulnerability that Butler identifies. That this bodily rupture reverberated throughout the social fabric of Ms. Schiavo's life evidences the sociality of bodily vulnerability. Insofar as Ms. Schiavo, like all of us, was constituted by, quote, the enigmatic traces of others, as Butler puts it, those others, known and unknown, are caught up in the seismic aftershocks of Ms. Schiavo's bodily trauma. Those traces, etched as they were into Ms. Schiavo's very being, were the tracks others followed to become Terry Schiavo, to step into that space of subjectivity depleted by Ms. Schiavo's brain injury to speak on her behalf. Against that backdrop, I hear more in the following passage than perhaps Butler intended. Quote, the body implies mortality, vulnerability, agency. The skin and the flesh expose us to the gaze of others, but also to touch and to violence. And bodies put us at the risk of becoming the agency and instrument of all these as well, unquote. Becoming Terry Schiavo, part three, the sanctity of life. And I start with another epigraph, this time from George Philos, Mr. Schiavo's lawyer. Quote, perhaps a lot of the opposition to Mrs. Schiavo's situation had more to do with the fear of death rather than the sanctity of life. The critical thing, of course, is not just to acknowledge vulnerability, but to find ways to live ethically into this shared state. Here, too, I find Butler's work helpful. In the concluding essay of Precarious Life, Butler turns to Emmanuel Levinas as a source for an ethic that can handle vulnerability differently. Butler is drawn to Levinas' account of a vulnerability that precedes or exceeds language and subject formation, a vulnerability of and to the other that calls us to responsibility for the other and thence into subjecthood. This vulnerability, which Levinas calls the face, presents concomitantly as a command, thou shalt not kill me. This command takes the form not of a Kantian categorical imperative, but of the other's material vulnerability to being killed by me. Two things emerge from Butler's account of Levinas here that I find particularly helpful. The demand from the other is not first and foremost linguistic or even conscious. 
it can present itself to us through various forms of bodily comportment. Butler mentions the agony and fear communicated by certain body postures viewed from behind, for example. Thus, our obligation to the other is not dependent on conscious expression of need or demand. It is, however, the face's relationship to death that strikes me as particularly helpful. Quoting Levinas now, Butler writes, the face is not in front of me, en face de moi, but above me. It is the other before death, looking through and exposing death. Secondly, the face is the other who asks me not to let him die alone, as if to do so were to become an accomplice in his death, unquote. Here, I think we are brought face to face, so to speak, with perhaps the fundamental layer of the ethical dilemma presented by becoming Terry Schiavo. We are simultaneously vulnerable and responsible. That rightly terrifies us. And yet we must, indeed we will, one way or the other, respond. As others must, indeed will, respond to us. I am not here going to take sides. I'm going to leave each of you with the demand of this particular face and the others that it may call to mind. In the time remaining to me, however, I want to shift our attention to a dimension of Ms. Shivo's case that has heretofore been overlooked, but one that resonates with Butler's call for an alternative Levinasian ethics. Let me repeat part of the quotation from Precarious Life I read earlier. Quote, the skin and the flesh expose us to the gaze of others, but also to touch and to violence, unquote. Elsewhere in the same essay, Butler elaborates on that theme, noting our vulnerability to, quote, a range of touch that includes the eradication of our being at the one end and the physical support for our lives at the other. This is a common human vulnerability, one that emerges with life itself and precedes the formation of the eye. Levinas, too, takes up touch, most infamously in relationship to the romantic caress, figured, unfortunately, in some somewhat sexist and heteronormative terms. But in at least one context, he writes of, quote, the caress of a consoler, unquote. This caress provides comfort, not by ending suffering or compensating for it. Indeed, this contact, quote, is not concerned with what is to come afterwards in economic time, unquote. Yet this caress affects a shift in the sufferer's relationship to pain, time, and even to herself. Quote, this effect of compassion, he writes, is infinitely mysterious, unquote. These invocations of touch draw our attention to what went on outside the view of the media and its audience. The interactions between Ms. Shivo and her caregivers, those who bathed her, turned her, diapered and clothed her until she drew her last breath. The caregiver, caregiver's touch could not restore to Ms. Shivo her full subjectivity, but one can hope that in meeting her material needs, their tactile caring for, done with skill and compassion, granted dignity to and marked the boundaries of subjectivity's loss through the initial trauma and ultimately in death. The religious activists gathered outside the hospice were motivated by their desire to preserve the sanctity of life, and I do not doubt their sincerity. However, if anyone actually had the opportunity to preserve the sanctity of Ms. Shivo's life within the context of this media circus, I would submit that it was the hospice workers not by presumptively stepping into the space opened up by her vulnerability, but by sheltering that vulnerability through touch. Surely we can find in this form of contact and care a model for ethical and perhaps even political responsibility in the face of vulnerability that is worthy of consideration and even emulation. Um, well, Thank you very much. I, I just want to say first, I'm extremely honored to be here and um, uh, and very interested in um, the challenge that has been delivered to me uh, by this invitation. Um, you've, lure, you've lured me out here. <laughs> you've um, uh, challenged me to think uh, in some new ways. And uh, you've also brought me back to some ways that um, I think I was indeed thinking before I knew what my so-called position was, right? Um, so it's nice to think outside and before and, out and, and beyond one's own position. Um, and I'm, I'm really grateful for the exchange. Um, these are both, I think, quite, um, <clears throat> quite wonderful papers. I had a chance to, again, to read them this morning. <laughs> and um, 
and like them uh, both for their differences and, and for the different kinds of um, uh, challenges that they pose. Um, I would like, um, I think, to um, begin by um, referring to Catherine's um, quite, quite extraordinary essay, um, and in particular, uh, her reference to the problem of, of undoing. Um, undoing as an active verb, being undone, something passively undergone. Um, undoing moves, I think, uh, uh, always between its passive and its active formulations. Um, one can uh, be engaged in undoing something where, where it takes a, a, transitive, a transitive object. Um, one can be in a state of being undone. One can uh, undo what one has done. Uh, one can undo one's own undoneness. Um, uh, uh, one can be undone and therefore not be doing anything. <laughs> no longer doing anything. Um, the two meanings that I think are salient for me, and and I keep working in these two directions, and I'm not quite sure they are synthesized or easily mediated, um, has to do with undoing in the sense of taking apart um, as, as one uh, undoes dominant gender norms, as one undoes the dominant norms of citizenship, as one undoes heteronormativity, uh, the taking apart, the disassembling of constraints and norms that are understood to be restrictive and unjustifiably so. Usually when one undoes constraints and norms in that way, one, one is acting in the name of liberty or freedom or justice or some other set of positive um, or aspirational norms. Um, but I think that when one is undone, um, undone by another or undone by an experience or in the course of an experience, um, that something is not taken apart, but something comes apart. Hmm. Uh, something that once seemed to hold no longer holds. Something that once um, uh, seemed to have a certain kind of integrity or self-sufficiency turns out um, to have an internal disparity or lack of self-sufficiency. So one could be, for instance, in a critical mode, um, actively undoing forms of oppression, norms that are restrictive. At the same time, one could be coming apart in relationship to something that moves one, um, that undoes one, um, constitutive relations with others, um, experiences of anger, grief, desire, jealousy, one can become undone. Uh, overwhelming sense of transience, overwhelming sense of loss, or indeed of awe, one can be undone, one can come apart. Uh, perhaps one cannot even say that one comes apart when it is the one, mm -hmm. or the oneness of the one. <laughs> that has come apart in in that very experience. Um, so how can I move in both directions at the same time, critically taking restrictive norms apart, but also becoming undone in something that is larger than me or by something that I am related to constitutively, which calls into question the primacy or centrality of the I itself? Um, I think that um, it must be true that the I who becomes centralized when, when the I endeavors to take apart a certain kind of uh, restriction or injustice um, also becomes decentralized when it is a matter of affirming that to which I am bound, which decentralizes me in some crucial way. So maybe there is a rhythm, if one might go in a white handian direct, a direction, a, a, a rhythm between centralization and decentralization in these two projects. I'm not sure. Um, I really appreciated being 
pressed on the question of the relationship of unknowingness or opacity to the question of the infinite. And of course, it raises for me whether there is a theological implication in the idea of opacity um, or of the apophatic. Um, and my first thought was, well, I don't know about the infinite. Um, could we perhaps return to the pre-Socratic idea of the indefinite, which of course also has its early modern versions, um, that boundless stuff, <laughs> uh, the apiron mm -hmm. uh, of the pre-Socratics. Um, uh, and then of course I realized that in my own um, uh, uh, Jewish education, um, uh, uh, it was imperative that whatever um, whatever God might be could not be fully spoken, right? Yahweh could not be fully mm -hmm. spoken. Uh, it could not be fully represented. Hence the um, uh, the the ban against idolatry. Um, uh, it always somehow hovered at the limits of representability and had to be precisely that. Uh, maybe something of that also works um, in my work, uh, despite me or because of me, uh, <laughs> um, and that it is in some ways operative. Um, I, I, I do not deny it. I am myself unknowing. Maybe I'm partially knowing. Maybe what I partially know is a link to some uh, uh, religious form of thinking that certainly um, informs my own. So even though I may not be in the middle of the debates on deconstruction and theology, maybe the debates on deconstruction and theology are nevertheless working through me in ways that I'm not always clear about. Um, one question, um, uh, actually, that both these papers pose to me in an interesting way um, is whether even though um, Perhaps this idea of the social as including a, an idea of uh, interrelatedness and constitutive um, uh, relationality um, is, I think, very important for um, uh, dislodging certain subject-centered ways of thinking, um, dislodging certain egological ways of thinking, um, perhaps it still remains within a certain kind of human wor world and does not take into sufficient account the interrelationships with other living organisms or non-human life. And I'm going to try to address that tomorrow evening. But what I just want to raise here um, is whether um, uh, there's a risk of restricting interrelationality to the social. Why, this, why should the social be the name for that interrelationality, or why is it the exclusive name? Um, I'm also, I, I may be unknowing about the modes of my dependency on others. I may be unknowing about the ways in which others have formed me. Um, uh, I may become unknowing in certain way in relationship to others understood as other humans, but maybe there are other forms of unknowingness that uh, constitute me that are not restrictively um, social in that particular way. Uh, certainly, I am unknowing in relationship to the workings of my own body to a vast degree, um, and also to myriad dimensions of organic processes. Um, which doesn't mean I wouldn't be able to give you a sufficiently scientific explanation, but that my scientific explanation would always come up against a certain kind of limit, since it wouldn't be able to explain, that is to say, fully give a conceptual um, uh, uh, explication for uh, that to which it refers. In other words, mm, there's, some, there's some incommensurability between explication and phenomenon that's never fully um, overcome. Another way of saying this is to ask what it is that exceeds any frame or every frame. How do we think about life in particular as this kind of excessive moment that, mm, that various kinds of explanatory frames or descriptive frames uh, seek to take in, seek to understand, but which also um, has a continuously excessive 
dimension that makes us have to frame again, <laughs> or that, that makes no one frame into a complete or final frame. Um, one thing I would like to ask, and, and this is going to be an open question for me and something I, I hope to learn, um, and I think it's raised again by both of the papers in different ways, which is the question of, of grief um, or, and of loss. Um, I've always um, uh, enjoyed asking the question of whether Deleuze, for instance, could ever come up with a theory of mourning. And I've and I've actually I've, I've asked many Deleuzeans. It's one of the few, first things I say to them when I meet them. Um, and even my good friend um, Monique David Menard, who is a psychoanalyst and a Deleuzean, um, says, "No, no, no, you can't do this. It's not possible." But 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 um, but maybe it is, and I don't know whether it is. And I, but I wish someone would work with that. And then my question is, well, what about Whitehead? Can he? Can he come up with that? I mean, I'm aware of the various efforts to bring the two together, but I was struck by um, Catherine's uh, concession here on page 13. Um, process thought, except in its pastoral and practical forms, um, um, not germane to this discussion, may lose touch with the grief of the morning implied but systematically depersonalized in its own horribly wide perspective. For in its avoidance of the standard anthropocentrism of most Western philosophy and theology, including its relationalisms, the incorporative losses that make us human remain, shall we say, underdetermined. Perpetual perishing in Whitehead undoes all momentary subjects, marking the beat of the rhythmic, emotive repetition, which has taken the place of inert matter. But only in the cosmically rare instances of humans and their heavier emotions would grief play a role. Um, interestingly, one cannot argue that the transgenerational Wirkungsgeschichte of Whiteheading and, Whiteheading and thought is any less ethical, sociopolitically or communally speaking, than other progressively oriented theories. So it's a question for me. Um, I understand that there is perishing as part of a kind of rhythm. Um, I want to know if there are eternal objects, are there also perishable objects? Maybe there's an easy answer to that. I also understand that there's an important concept of the limit, um, but where and when can we think destruction and loss? Um, do we have to be careful of those moments in which just destruction and loss are taken up as part of a rhythm? Um, is that a redemptive moment? Is it, does it gloss certain kinds of irreversible or even uh, unfathomable losses. Um, um, here I just simply uh, stand to learn. I hope to talk more about some of these issues tomorrow, but perhaps it's worth noting as well, at least here, that I will be interested in trying to think anew um, the distinction between metaphysics and ontology, something I thought I had, to, you know, was done with. Uh, and now I'm suddenly undone by a new set of problems, um, which makes me wonder um, whether I've, I've got to go back to the drawing board. Um, I uh, um, understood metaphysics always as an inquiry into the structure of reality, the ultimate structure of reality, importantly. And I understood ontology as the inquiry into being. And this last, the inquiry into being, was um, for me an inquiry that had to take into account the inquiry itself and the interrogative position in order to know and to lay out the full parameters of what could be understood as being. And one, of course, knows this from Heidegger, I think, quite well, but it also became important for me as I started to think about discursive ontologies or regimes of ontology or or um, uh, regional ontologies in Foucault. There it seemed that the discursive circumscription of being was part of that being, and we couldn't take, we couldn't extricate being from the discursive mode of its appearance. But then, of course, coming across um, Whitehead uh, and some of these perspectives in which it's really clear that the inquiry into metaphysics 
uh, involves an inquiry into organic processes, and that inquiry itself has to be understood as a kind of organic process. Okay, I'll think again. Um, I want to say this. I'm really moved, I think, um, in Catherine's text by the reference to hospice uh, at the end, and I think it's extremely important. Um, and um, I've unfortunately had a, had recent occasion to think about hospice. Um, it's unfortunate, unfortunate, I, I guess I, I would say. <laughs> and I'm interested in that mode of proximity and even the scene of address that, that, proc that, that hospice provides. Um, hospice, interestingly enough, neither heals nor does it destroy. So it's not, it cannot, re it cannot redeem a life, uh, but nor may it damage a life. Um, and there is always a chance <laughs> that something healing might happen or that some damage might occur. So it's also, in some sense, a practice of care that carries enormous risk. Um, and as a result, a practice of care of, of, of heightened responsibility. I understand that it, it aims to make the end of life more comfortable, but does not seek to deny the end of life, um, nor does it even seek to defer it. So there's some acceptance, a profound acceptance of the end of life, but also end of life as process. Um, uh, the touch, I think, is extremely interesting in this relationship, since the touch, it may function as consolation, but it may also be part of the everyday care, um, readjusting the trach or, uh, um, or, or, or moving the body or helping reposition someone or turning them over. Um, so the touch as consolation and as assistance um, or, or even as an extension, a proprioceptive extension of the body is perhaps not fully distinguishable. Um, it's an occasion in which we might think about withness or in even thereness, <laughs> like what are the fundaments of, of proximity, being with another, there for another. Um, um, we could also understand it as a certain lending of presence, especially um, for those um, for whom um, uh, uh, um, uh, speech or or hearing is no longer possible. Um, and um, I think it also, very interestingly, apart from infancy, is one of the very few times when another person um, is proximate to every bodily function. I mean, obviously, this also happens in, in certain kinds of hospitalization as well. But where the proximity of a person to every bodily function is, is presupposed, um, and it's a it's a kind of proximity that actually mm, in, in which the body the body cannot function without that proximity sometimes. Um, now, um, what interests me here um, is, of course, uh, that we think of, we sometimes think about ethical the ethical scene as one of relationality as one in which there is. Mm, call and response, right? Somebody calls upon me, I respond to them. There's something of a gift or a reception or of an exchange of some kind. But here we're talking about proximity and an ethical scene in which there can be no response. There can be no reciprocity of that kind. There might be reciprocity of another kind, but there cannot be reciprocity of that kind. Um, one can speak to without being heard, um, uh, one can ask questions without an answer, um, um, and yet some kind of unilateral address takes place. Um, but at, what I want to suggest is that the breathing body, the body as breathing organism, even when it is reduced to that, still registers something from the outside um, by virtue of its organic um, uh, constitution, that there still is a registering of something 
even though it's no longer the conscious eye that registers, and we may not want to call it language, right? Let's not, you know, and here I'm ready. Let's not stretch the idea of language, you know, to cover every and all, you know, um, all, all movements of that kind. Um, uh, and interestingly, I'm not sure it's consolation, but it may simply be the registering of proximity of some kind. Um, and, and I think the reason why it's so important is that because what is being addressed is the, or, is the, the, the living organism of the body, not necessarily consciousness, unless we want to rethink consciousness as having some kind of non-cognitive presence in the organic body um, as such. Um, but, um, but, the, but human life was never just consciousness. <laughs> Um, it was also always its organic bodily fundament. And I know that that proves to be an, a really, really controversial claim for right to life, for abortion politics, for euthanasia. But I think, in fact, we have to move straight into it. And if we have normative arguments to make about why uh, reproductive technology is necessary, why abortion is justified, why euthanasia is justified. We have to do it on that basis, but n but we don't need to concoct, I think, um, a kind of false anthropocentrism in order to make strong normative claims of that kind. That's another issue we can go to. Um, I want. I just want to say a few a few other things here, um, and one is. Um, um, that, of course, in the case of Terry Schiavo, we have to think about the particular way that marriage, family, patrilineality, heteronormativity all regulate the body as property. But I think we also have to specify in what sense she, has be, she had become property. Um, because the real debate was about who could serve as the legitimate proxy for her will. In other, way, in other words, who has the right to substitute for her consent. So it's not just owning her, she's mine, I can do anything I want with her. It's rather, I, my voice is the voice that now stands for hers. So what are the legitimate ways in which that substitution or proxy relation can take place? Um, and, um, and it's not that the proxy claims to know what she would have wanted um, uh, by virtue of some kind of proximity. It's rather that the proxy, um, by virtue of a certain kind of social legitimacy, juridically recognized, takes precedent. The, the desire of one proxy takes precedent over, over all others. Um, so, Shivo's vulnerability to discursive expropriation exemplifies, in some sense, the extreme of bodily vulnerability to another. Right? We've talked about hospice as offering one kind of um, um, uh, touch or or registration of presence, but here we can also talk about a vulnerability to expropriation. Um, since this is a body that cannot speak for itself, uh, another then gets to bid for legal rights to speak for it. But we can ask a different kind of question, I think, about rights and obligations, not who gets to speak for it, but rather um, what obligations emerge from the situation of being so fully exposed and vulnerable in relation to others, and what social obligations emerge on the part of those who who remain um, conscious, speaking, acting, and able um, to attend to this living organism in a way that is as fair as possible. And, um, and I want to say um, uh, that, um, um, that Shaivo's situation could be described as an unlivable life. That's not the same as a negligible life. That's not the same as a life that doesn't count or a body that does not matter, right? An unlivable life is one that immediately entails an obligation to establish conditions of livability on all of us. And where those conditions of livability cannot be met, then we have to make another set of decisions. Um, indeed, 
I would also say that an unlivable life has to be grieved even before it perishes, right? A life that cannot be lived has already lost its possibility, and in that sense, it, it, it demands the grieving of that loss. Um, and we can, I think, um, uh, abhor and grieve the un unlivability of a life, and that can move us to the situation um, of seeking to make it more livable, or if not livable, um, survivable in the way that hospice does, or and, and if not survivable under those conditions, not survivable, and then to be more properly and fully grieved. Um, I think the situation of radical powerlessness, exposure, vulnerability, can give rise to um, an ethics that, that seeks to shelter precarity, or it can give rise to um, um, a number of other kinds of ethical or, or less than ethical positions, including um, uh, the radical grab for power that we saw on the part of the family members. It's as if Shivo's powerlessness gave rise to a wretched battle for power, uh, which involved an exploitation of that, of that powerlessness, in my view. In any case, I want to just say, um, finally, that I, I think um, that Shivo didn't lose her humanity um, by losing her consciousness. Um, and in part because of the persistent, his, her, her historicity is part of her being, her story, her history, her, her relations, her life, but also because um, she was returned to the fundaments of life, both bodily and social, radical interdependency, organic process aided by intervention, human, technological. Um, she was returned to the fundaments of life at the same time, you know, that were, that are both organic and technological and human. That was a, that world, that final world was an organic, technological, and human world. It was still an in complex environment. Um, and it seems to me that this situation of complex interdependency um, was both a condition of her persistence and the um, occasion for her uh, exploitation. Um, uh, but that actually she is no different from any of the rest of us uh, in exemplifying these dimensions of life. She just exemplified them in the extreme. Um, okay, so those are my thoughts for this evening, and we'll continue this, I'm sure, tomorrow. And I thank you for the chance um, to think with you.